episode 143 of the Rudis Wrestling Podcast, along with Matt Dernland. I am uh, Jason Bull Hurley Bryant here. I'm going with the uh, my favorite theme of Over the Top as the arm wrestling champion that lost to the great Lincoln Hawk from the Independent Truckers. Um, yeah, that's that's what all this is right now. Bull Hurley in the house. In I'm, the flesh. Fe- I'm feeling it, JB. I'm feeling it. I don't know how you I know you're, you're locked down and you broke out the Clippers, but I, I like it. I'm digging it. That's called boredom and male pattern baldness. All, I'm, <laughs> I was on a conference call with wrestlers in business network with the earbud in. I'm sitting there helping my daughter with her, her distance learning. And I'm just like, screw it. <laughs> Went to my bedroom, got my clippers and I'm not, I'm keeping the beard. Usually I cut the beard off post NCAAs to get my face some color. But a problem is, is, you know, as I said, I'm 40 and this is starting to creep away and I didn't like what it looked like. And I'm like, I'm not ready to go completely all the time. I'll let it grow back a little bit, but I've got, it, it will come back pretty terribly. And uh, Seattle Williams from from Flow, uh, was it two years ago I had done this? Actually, it was last year. I had bicked it, actually, and I'm at Nationals and walks up. I haven't seen him in a while. I go, what's up, C.I.M.A.? He goes, man, you going bald. I'm like, oh, come on. Not hi, how you doing? It's you going bald. I'm like, anybody that knows Sion knows that that is not a surprising response from no. him. So that's what this is. We're getting some sunlight. Maybe I can get some color on this very pale English-Scottish heritage I've got going on right now. But today, Matt, we're talking... 75th anniversary team again. We move to the middleweights, which is the weight classes between 142 and 172. And uh, after our discussion, surprisingly, did not get either of us excommunicated from the wrestling community uh, when, when we bumped uh, you know, one of the goats, Mr. Mr. John W., out of the top five of the lightweights. I was I was expecting some backlash, but so far, a uh, response. Maybe it hasn't hit Stillwater yet. Maybe maybe uh, John's not not on the YouTubes and, and not a subscriber to the show yet. So, uh don't tell him please don't yes <laughs> but you know and it's also been an interesting weekend uh, that one topic that you guys know from me about not going to discuss it today i'm going to be talking about that at at length on on various places we'll we'll, we'll touch on it here in a, in a future episode but as for now we've got this topic to get through matt and middleweights the team so again as if you're just jumping in we are looking at the 75th anniversary team that was released in 2005 why because we're 15 years away from that moment we didn't have a nationals this year we need something to talk about and i still was bitter about gray simons not being on that team but i can't just pick one segment and say one guy needs to be replaced we're like all right let's look at this so the middleweights we have a, a great group here. And I think this is going to be a really fun discussion, especially since a lot of these guys are, are out of both of our age brackets and, and out of some of the age brackets of even our parents in some respects. But uh, the team is Lee Kemp of Wisconsin, Lincoln McElravey from Iowa, Wade Chalice of Clary and Pat Smith from Oklahoma state, Joe Williams from Iowa. And again, the team was voted on by the fans in 2005, where each weight category, each of the light, middle, and upper weights had 15 names, and you picked five. So essentially, it's not the greatest 15 of all time. It's the greatest five, five, and five. So uh, that gives us a little bit of leeway to play with uh, how we're booting people off, because in some cases, I would probably still have John. If this was the best 15 of that 45, I think John Smith would still be on it. But if we were sticking with the lightweights, it makes us make those tough decisions, Matt. Yes, I agree. And, you know, when I started looking at this and going down through everybody on the list first, I was like, oh, this is pretty straightforward. And then the more I dug into it, I'm like, no, this may be more difficult than than the previous uh, podcast when we were talking about the lightweights. But it's a fun discussion because we're talking about just the just all time greats and how you, how do you distinguish all time greats? I guess you have to split hairs, right? So we'll we'll, we'll do the best job we possibly can. <laughs> Well, splitting hairs, Jason. I'll split hairs. Um, you can. I'm avoiding splitting hairs. That's why I did this. <laughs> right. right. So this is, this is by design. If if you're listening, you have no idea. Well, I've just told you that I have shaved my head, so that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. So let's let's jump right in here. I think I think. Do you want to start at the top end? Because I think that those are obvious discussion pieces that we can probably move on from. We can probably establish some of the top. Guys, that there's no consideration that they will move out of this list, right? Yeah, and and of those, I I presented them in the order that I would rank them in terms of you know compared to the field. And Lee Kemp, the more you t- and oh, it's, what's interesting about these guys is they all have a high number of losses, considerably speaking. Whereas you know we, we talked about 
you know, Gray Simons had one loss. And then, you know, we know that when we get to the upper weights, Kale has, has zero and there's, a, but we're seeing double digit losses when we get here in the middleweights. That's probably a testament to the depth of the weight classes, but there's some, some names in here that in this research, I found like, Oh my goodness, this guy, again, like our Dwayne Keller situation, don't get talked about enough. And this is one of these things, again, the history lessons that just kind of open my eyes and it starts to send you down some rabbit holes and, and get you digging up stuff. Like, for example, on my desk right now, I have the January 16th edition of Wrestling News and Reports, which was amateur wrestling news. It is a, it's a, it's a regeneration. It's a, it's, it's a copy from 1956 and the inter- interesting stuff going through. And I tweeted a, a picture of the dual meet from the very first edition, which was this dual meet VMI and Auburn was the very first dual meet sent out in amateur wrestling news, which was then wrestling news and reports. So it, it sends me down those, not just wrestlingstats.com. It, it, it sends me to my stacks to look up stories about these people, because again, at 40 years old, and I didn't even get into college wrestling until probably, you know, the late nineties. So when we tell stories about Lee Kemp, that's a recency guy in terms of like the 80 Olympic team, our coaches know about him and McElravey with the legendary mullet and the, the relentless attitude. But we get into some of these these older guys. It makes it interesting. But Lee Kemp is always one that because he's still in the spotlight. He is. He's had a documentary that's come out on him. He's written a book. He's been he's been a public figure since he got back into wrestling. I mean, there was a time that he was out of wrestling and you didn't know where he was at. And then he came back and he's been he's been around. I mean, you know, I recently finished up a, a podcast series that I'm developing with with Pat Christensen from Las Vegas events on Mark Chirella. So I got to hear a little bit of the dynamic between Chirella and Kemp. But Kemp went two one one one. And in the four-year All-American era, and that one we know was a loss to Chuck Yagla from Iowa by a referee's decision. So we had a 19-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old Lee Kemp in the national finals against a guy who was going to on, be on the Olympic team with him, you know, several years later. So I think it's just a slam dunk that Lee Kemp is on this team. I mean, no, really no discussion other than how great Lee Kemp was as a wrestler. Yeah, I mean... Lee Kemp being an Ohio guy was always a guy that I had heard about. Obviously I was, I was a a young boy when he was coming up through Chardon, Ohio, winning a couple state titles. What's fascinating about his story is where he came from. He, he started wrestling in ninth grade and literally four years later was wrestling another all time great in the finals as a true freshman, a true freshman at the university of Wisconsin and for this to go down to a referee's decision, I mean, he was, it was a split decision too. At the time, I believe, and I'm, fill, fill my blanks in here, JB, because I don't. I'm still, I'm still need to research the referee situations because back then they had the, the overtime and then, yeah, it was a split. I'm not sure exactly right. how they're, maybe I'll get Pat, maybe even get Pat McCormick on the show. Right. He was a, he was a young spry up and coming referee back in the, no, he wasn't. He's been around <laughs> forever. Maybe we can get Pat to explain how that was on a future episode, but yeah, it was, I a, believe, it was a referee's decisions. I believe what it went, you, you wrestled regulation, you wrestled uh, the regulation match, you went into overtime. And if, if the match wasn't determined in overtime, then it went basically like in boxing Mm -hmm. to the cards it went to a referee's decision and on a three to two vote uh yagla was awarded the decision that's my limited knowledge on that you know because there's not a lot i couldn't find a lot on that i've always heard about the referee's decision but i didn't i don't know the particulars about how it was arrived at this decision i do know it was a split decision um Mm -hmm. so Um, that's an interesting component about how you factor in. We, we were a choice away from anointing what would have been the first four time champ 30 years prior or 20 years prior to, to Kale Sanderson, basically, or Pat Smith, Pat, no, it would have been 15 years. Yeah. Pat was 94. 94. So we're talking, yeah, you know, 14, 15 years. Now, one thing I also, I, I, I'm already, we're already that short into the show and I misspoke when I numbered these, I actually numbered the, the lightweights. I'd actually didn't number. I numbered that middleweights, but I didn't number them in order. I just numbered them. So I, I misspoke here. So yeah, Lee Kemp uh, could be, makes an argument for number one on this list. Now, again, going one, 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 one is Pat Smith. He would be my number one because he's got, he was the first guy to do it. You know, the storied program, it was, you know, he, he did something nobody else had ever done. And when you're, you're one of the four or four timers, and the first to do it, you are you are number one on that list. I know that you know Lee is a, again freestyle accomplishments are not being considered here. It's 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 you know it's great smoke to add to the fire. 
I don't think that's a thing, but it's, it's a great discussion point to add to the fire. And, and we sit there and, you know, I, I would actually put Pat Smith as one, and then we can argue the rest. I think Kemp is a strong number two, but again, Pat Smith being the first to do it. And in a, a, a household of four legendary wrestling brothers, I mean, you know, got Leroy leading the way, then, you know, John W. Pat and then Mark coming behind and then all, all the sisters and their kids wrestling. Mark Perry, for example, Mark and Chris Perry are, are part of that, that bloodline. We all know that, but Pat Smith, was the first guy to do it. And that puts that's that really does cement him as number one. And now if Lee Kemp had won that referee's decision, like we're alluding to Kemp would be one because he would be the first four timer and he would be first on the list. So maybe, maybe that's the way to talk myself into this, this order here, Matt, but uh, 94, what do you remember about Pat Smith and his four titles? Well, obviously we know his pedigree. We know the family, we know the program. These are all, but to actually be the first one, I mean, that's just, I mean, in, in some ways, I know that people would probably not rank him as the GOAT, but I would say anybody that does the first, is the first to do it, has to have a special distinction in my mind because it does, it takes away, he had to defeat history, number one. There'd been so many guys that had come close and to, to be that guy that kicks down the door and, and being from a family where I had two other brothers that won multiple state championships, I know it was a lot easier for me to walk through that door because they kicked it down. And I think that's the significance and the greatness of Pat Smith is he was the first one to kick that door down. And let's not forget he had to navigate through a pretty trying period of Okie state wrestling. Um, I believe there was a, he was able to red shirt, right. When they were on probation. So the, the program was in flux between, I believe if I'm, if I'm right, JB, correct me if I'm wrong, but between his third and fourth year, he, did he have to take a year off or when, when was that when Okie state was on probation? Uh, Pat Smith took redshirted in 1993. So that would, uh, be right about, right about that time. Okay. So, I mean, I, think, I not, think it was the 93 season. Not only was, was he trying to become the first, but he had to navigate this, the landscape of his program being put on probation, potential, the potential of a death penalty was, was discussed at the time. So, Balancing all those all those emotional things in addition to the physical realities and what we've talked about, like just to win a national championship is difficult, but to win four can, you know, four, you know, you have to avoid sickness, you have to avoid injury, you have to avoid so many, so many pitfalls and everybody's everybody's gunning for you. Everybody is giving you their best effort. It doesn't really matter matter. A, a dual meet in the West gym at, at UNI or the national finals. It doesn't matter. You were going to get everyone's best effort. So he had to get up, perform and, you know, reel off, you know, 20 matches to win four straight titles or close to it. Yeah. And you go back and watch that clip. I've just here is like, four time. You hear Alaverdi just in the background and it just, it, it does kind of suck you back into a time warp a little bit and be like, wow, what would it have been like to, like you know, from the announcer and me to be like, how would I have said that? And I don't think I could have done it. Any, I obviously don't think I could have done it any better than Ed because you only get a chance at history one time. And it's just like, wow, just going back. And I mean, granted, we had the it was it, the images are grainy, even though it's not like it's not like ancient footage. But it's just like I, I'm just watching the the reaction, the media build up that that was provided to us on TV, and that somebody has probably illegally copyrighted, <laughs> put up all over the place. Those aren't legal files. But uh, just being able to see that and then and try to look at that image and like, man, what what would that be like today? That's one of the cool things that, uh, you know, this this little research project we're doing here is has is kind of brought us. Now, I think those are pretty much the shoe ins right there with Kemp. And then we get to the 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 barrage of three time champions that are in this. And when we, we look at numbers and we want to assign a point value, there are very few one 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 twos, meaning not necessarily that order, but we don't we have a finalist and three championships. One of those guys that fits that bill is Lincoln McElravey from Iowa. We've talked about his his victory over Jerry Abbas. That that is a match that is is legendary when it terms about uh, the tank, the motor, the intensity. This, I mean, Lincoln has even just in hindsight and looking at his career because I again got into wrestling at the tail end of his career. Had a chance to watch him on the international circuit a little bit as I was learning about the sport of wrestling, but. 
Lincoln just had that look that he gets a couple extra bonus points for, not because of the mullet, but Lincoln McElravey and his heyday just looked like a guy that was going to kick your ass. And you get bonus points for that, in my opinion. I just he had that look, the meanness, and he had the wrestling ability, the 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 boot scoot from from who knows where. I mean, he could hit it from anywhere. It was just one of those things. It's like that's a guy. People say the Brands Brothers personified Iowa wrestling. Well, to me, when I'm learning about the sport in that era, Lincoln McElravey is the guy I associate most with Iowa wrestling. Yeah, he was such a dynamic wrestler. He had it all. I mean, he had offense, he had defense. So many people talk about his gas tank and his offense, but it's, it's funny. We've been, you know, producing these clips called from the vault, where it's like digging into the archives of wrestling. And we've been able to secure a, a, a lot of footage from, from doc Bennett and those that know Hall doc, of Famer doc Bennett. Yeah, Hall of Famer, doc Bennett. They know he is the, he is the videographer of wrestling. He is every conceivable wrestling clip he's probably responsible for filming it so we've been able to secure footage from doc and we're digging back into the archives and bringing back the history of wrestling and a lot of the history that we've been digging into this week is lincoln mcarabey and it's just the one thing that i forgot that i was reminded of when watching lincoln was we talked about randy lewis and when you when you think about randy lewis you, he talks about his untouchable leg like you can't score on this leg. Well, Lincoln McElravey had two of those. Looking back on it, it's like, <laughs> good luck like getting to his leg. Getting to his leg was just the start. Like Finishing on one of those legs was near impossible. And to see, I mean, he was just like Houdini. Like the positions he 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 snatched, what, what is that saying? He snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat, like repeatedly every match, and especially his higher level matches on the international stage. You got to see the brilliance of his defense and the brilliance of his artistry. But yeah, I mean, he is a guy like just by sheer looks, he is a guy that you would probably turn the other way if you looked him in the eye because he, he had that persona of what a wrestler should look like. He scares the bejesus out of me, even today. I've only met him like twice. But he's the most beautiful. I mean, he's got a beautiful personality. He's so engaging, so personable. But I, he's, he He scares the crap out of me, Matt. I've never <laughs> <laughs> shook his hand and said hi one time. I think it was at the, the Stillwater a couple of years ago. I'm down there. And, uh, uh, you know, it was like I, I went. I, he was standing. I was saying congratulations to some people. And I thought, and I said, so, like, I, I was like, congratulations. Hi, <laughs> I just shook my hand and just just looked at me, and I just I just I just walked away. It wasn't like he was intimidating. It's just it was one of the okay. He was absolutely, I, and that doesn't happen to me. But it happened to it. it Lincoln did it to me, and I'm just like, uh, maybe it was just a, a moment where I was saying I was embarrassed by saying congratulations, and he had nothing to do with what was going on right there because uh, I was I was around a bunch of Hall of Famers. I'm like, oh hey, congrats, nice to see you. You know, I, and I was just I, I just went the other way. I have but- have never spoken to him since. So. But I'm then, st- yeah, I'm st- when, still scared the crap out of me. Yeah, but then when we think and we define the legacy of Lincoln McAravey, he defined an era of Iowa wrestling. But I think mm-hmm. if you look at the history, if you had to pick out three or four guys, he 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 would be on the Mount Rushmore of Hawkeye wrestling, hands down. And I mean, and that's a tough, that's also a very tough argument because uh, we're going to get, I mean, there's, uh, there's plenty of Hawkeyes on this list. There's another Hawkeye and, we're going to be talking about on this list. That yeah, has, I mean, well, there's a couple more on this list here, but in, in the parts of who's getting in, who's getting out. So I think those are the, the solid top three. When we go Pat Smith, Lee Kemp, Lincoln, McElravey, then we get to Wade Chalice and Joe Williams. I'm going to start with Joe Williams because he is a four-time All-American going seven, one, one, one. Uh, nine losses in his career. Uh, seven of those came as a freshman. So, which which you're going to see a lot of when you got four time All Americans, you're going to see those guys with those the most of their losses coming their freshman year. Uh, but what, what's interesting is looking at all the other guys that were three time champs. It's kind of hard. I definitely think recency bias hit the fan base, and of course the Iowa flooding the ballot because again, like I said last episode, even in two, even 15 years ago when there was something that was an online vote, Iowa crushed it. They have the, just they come out in numbers. They support their own. So that is no fault of anybody here, and that's not a blame game. That is not a loophole. But uh, when we look at some of the other other three timers, but when we look at Joe Williams, what may hurt him in our discussion further is 
you know, he, two, his two losses that, that put him in those seventh place matches were one was Sean Bormet, not, not one you can write off as uh, Oh, well that one stinks. No, <laughs> that's a good, that, that's what you, that's a good loss. I mean, that's not one people are going to look at and be like, Oh, that's going to knock you down a peg or two, but it was uh, Aaron Moran from Purdue who only placed once beat Joe in right after he had, he had hit the blood round in place and then knocked Joe Williams into the seventh round, uh, seventh place match. And you, you were telling me before the show that, that that's a name, you know, pretty well. He was from Purdue. Yeah, Aaron's a guy that I'm very close to, and I remember this match specifically watching Aaron beat beat Joe because Aaron, we grew up wrestling together. Literally, he was from about a half hour away. He would come over three times a week and work out with me and my brothers, and he actually brought his brothers over as well. And uh, so I'm very familiar with with Aaron. A lot of people don't know him. I personally know him, and he was he was a hammer. And incidentally, his brother is who I actually beat to win my first state title. Uh, so there's a lot of familiarity with, with this, uh, with, with this, uh, with this family and where he's from, we were talking about it and you said he was from Versailles, Ohio. I'm like, no, the Hicks out here, us Hicks, us rednecks here in Ohio, we call it Versailles. You are one. So you can say Yes, that. So I can say it. So we say it Versailles, Ohio, the rest of the country may say it Versailles, but I get it. But in Ohio, we only know it as Versailles. Yeah, we won't go to that. We won't have that discussion <laughs> when we talk about maybe the Carr family in, in Woodford County, Kentucky, which is, you know, I don't know, is it Versailles or Sales, Kentucky? We'll let that, we'll let you make that d- distinction there. But <sighs> what's also interesting about Joe Williams is that placement, seventh place, was as a true freshman. So that it's, it's kind of part of our argument or our discussion point is where do you get any benefit being a true freshman in this thing? And we really haven't approached that. Lee Kemp was a true freshman. Uh, Pat Smith was a true freshman. So, uh, we've got that Lincoln McElravey was a true freshman. As far as I remember, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure he had a red shirt year in there. I think they pulled him out of red shirt and he lost his first match. If I'm not mistaken. Right. Yes. Was it to Tony Periano is, I think that's what the, what the story goes. Um, I think Drew brings that up to me. Whenever I think, we talk, I, but... I think he actually majored. I think he actually majored Lincoln. Right. Mm, interesting. I that's, believe that's he one did. Of those that, you know, if, if, if we were into the decision makings of who the four time finalist, I mean, that might be the disqualifying loss. And then the others, Wade Chalice, who it was in an interesting time of where Clarion was athletically because he was did not place as a freshman, then won the college division slash division two, because that was right around the time that they had created division two and then won the university slash division one championships as a sophomore and junior, but was ruled ineligible as a senior. And because he had spent time at East Stroudsburg and they, t- they, they knocked that year off of his, his eligibility. So we're looking at a two-time champ with the DNP as a freshman. And unfortunately for Wade, I mean, it's one of those things that apparently the story is, is he beat three NCAA champions that year. And, uh, you know, and, and the quote is, is I may not be able, always able to beat you, but I can pin you. And of course, I don't think, uh, I mean, per our discussion the other day about him and Gene Mills, they're there, there, when you say the greatest pinners, Wade's going to come into the discussion. So, um, I'm not really, I, maybe again, maybe Wade's lore and his legend in Pennsylvania may have, inter, uh, you know, influenced this, but again, we get back to the situation where we have, we bumped John Smith out of the top five lightweights for not placing. I think this is kind of maybe where we start is uh, I think him and Joe Williams might be uh, one of those places where we have to start. We, well, we have to maybe look at the rest of the field to see, can they, can they, can they retain their spots here? It, for the purposes of this this discussion, because the DNP was lost to a guy named Bruce Trammell, who finished third and second from Ohio University. So uh, that that was the two losses, or that was the loss that knocked him out. And again, it was the follow the leader situation. So um, yeah, Bruce didn't get further, and that was that was Wade's shot. So um, it, I, I think it's kind of it. I don't think we can hold being ineligible against Wade because, according to the records, and let me just verify this again with the late Jay Hammond's wrestlingstats.com. I'm actually, sure Wade was. Un- I'm pretty sure I know some of this story because spending some time at Clarion, being a head coach there for a year, I got yeah, Wade I, was a little bit more. He with was high. He was 40, 0 and one his senior years and didn't get to wrestle. And I believe if we, if you, if you look into Jay's record, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Wade wrestled shorty Hitchcock. I believe Defeated. Yeah, that's the story. He he beat or pinned Shorty. I can't remember. I don't want to go out. I wouldn't surprise. It wouldn't surprise me if he pinned Shorty, but he did beat Shorty Hitchcock, who went on to win the NCAA tournament that year, um, along with two other NCAA champs. And I think w- when you look at Wade, 
there's the lore, there's the legend. Why? I mean, we've got the stories of him, you know, putting an X, taping an X on a mat and saying, I'm going to pin this person here and going, and he actually did it. He went out and pinned the person on the mat. Um, I always thought that was a wives tale until, until I arrived to Clarion sat down with coach Bub and I'm like, Hey coach, I know, I know we should be talking about the program, but before we talk about the program itself and how we need to build this thing back up, can you answer me this one question? I was like, did this actually happen? Like, I've always heard it. I've heard the stories. I've seen the written stories. And he said, no, Matt, it did happen. He literally Babe Ruth it, called his shot and put the X on the mark. Oh, man. I mean, because, again, that's one of those things that make Wade such a colorful character is stories like that. The the fact that, yes, he could, the, you know, inventor of the spladel and and, you know, his 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 colorful attitude. It's one of those things that, you know, Wade is always I mean, even even today, he, he makes sure that people still talk about him. I mean, here we are talking about him on the 75th anniversary team, 15 years after it came out and, you know, decades after his career ended. And uh, but again, from the stats situation, you've got a, one, a DNP, a one one. And then again, I don't think we can we're going to penalize him for being ineligible here because 40 0 and one was def, I mean, he was probably going to win that title. So you, you're you're in a situation where you probably could have a three time champion. In, in, and let's give him the credit too for the college slash university division, college slash division two, because uh, those are, you know, we gave Carlton, we're going to give Carlton House rig that credit. We talked about it with Gray Simons and his NAIA title. So, you know, Wade has a strong argument here, but I'd really think ultimately when we get to the nitty gritty that DNP as a freshman is probably going to knock him out, even though it was a, an arrow with one loss. And if he would have wrestled back, maybe he could have taken third. So, again, we can't rewrite the history. We've got the, the, the facts that we're at. So those are the five. And then, now we get to the the ten that are going to challenge for these spots. Daryl Burley of Lehigh, Nate Carr of Iowa State, Mark Trella of Michigan, Tommy Evans from Oklahoma, Stanley Henson of Oklahoma State, Kerry Colat from Penn State and Lock Haven, Bill Cole from Northern Iowa, Tim Krieger from Iowa State, Wayne Martin from Oklahoma, Bill Nelson from Northern Iowa, and Jim Zaleski from Iowa. So uh, some of those things on the list, I, I guess we can start with, I don't know, we start with the three-timers, I mean, or just go alphabetically. I think that may be an easy way to do it because first on the list is the guy that in, intrigues me the most is Daryl Burley from uh, from Lehigh. 94-5-1, and one, had two losses as a freshman, two losses as a sophomore, one as a junior, none as a senior, placed one, two, two, one, and of his five losses, Let's see. He's got five losses. So Randy Lewis, Mike Land, two to Randy Lewis, one to Jim Gibbons, and he tied Randy Lewis. So four of his five losses are to one of the all-time greats, Randy Lewis. So uh, no disqualifying losses there and a four-time finalist. So I think Daryl Burley has a really strong case here too, even though he only won two titles. Really strong case. And, and again, you know, I think there's, I think there's some geographic bias in here. But I think there's a geographic bias because that's who you know. Like before the show, we were breaking down the others on the list and we're getting to the others now. And I'm going through not only today's section of the middleweights, but the but the lightweights and the heavyweights. And like there's all these unbelievable Okie State wrestlers that I'm not familiar with, which, you know, I pride myself in in having a good historical knowledge. I'm not going to say I'm a historian, but I, I pride myself in, on knowing the names in the sport and hopefully knowing some of the stories in the sport. And when you think about Okie State and their 48 national titles, it's amazing to me. Like th maybe they have such a laundry list, list of greats. They all, all, they all drowned out each other to a certain extent because you look you say at four, 48, they got 34 in wrestling. They got 48 or 48 other or Yeah. My bad. Is it 34 I mean, in County? 34. My bad. Was they they might have 48 as a school. So I think maybe 48, that's, maybe I think that's, that's where I, I saw it. My bad. My bad. Yeah. But, maybe, but yeah. Like I just said, I'm not a historian and thank you. I, yeah. But what I'm saying is like, maybe all these greats, they have all these significant greats. And I've, I've talked to other Okie state wrestlers that, that I have personal relationships with. And they're like, Matt, you don't understand. Like if you're just a national champ, and I say that with, with all respect to every national champ out there, but they're like, if you're just a national champ at Okie state, you're just one of the guys you're not like anywhere. You're just one of the guys. And that just speaks to what they, their contribution, their dominance in the sport that they have all these two, three timers that we're looking at. And like, 
who is this guy? And it's like, well, I'm one of the other two or three timers from Okie State, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yo, and sometimes I, when I go down to the Hall of Fame each year, and I'll sit there and I'll talk to Leroy Smith and, and some of the, the old Cowboys will come through or the Aggies back in the day. And they'll, they'll start throwing names at me. And I'm just like, oh, just nod your head. Just just nod your head. You've heard. OK, you've heard the name. OK, don't don't try to bring up facts. Just, oh, yeah, Tommy Evans. You know, he's, he's a sooner. You're like, oh, yes. Oh, Dr. Stanley Henson. That's a guy I know. I actually, actually interviewed him uh, one time before, before his passing. But, yeah, that's one of those things like. If you don't know it when you go down to Stillwater, just just nod your head and say, oh, yeah, you know, just don't try to tell any stories. Just fake it, fake it, get out of that conversation <laughs> because you are going to look stupid. And, and the same thing can be said for for the uh, the generation of people that came through at Northern Iowa, you know, <laughs> in Cornell College in that era, too. It's like, you know, Bill Nelson, Bill Smith, Bill Cole, you just just this just smile and nod because really it's hard to contribute to a discussion there, at least with with uh, the seventies and eighties, when we get into it, we've got some film we've got, you know, for the most part, those, those athletes are still alive. So uh, you have an opportunity to cross paths with them, but uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, Burley again, Lehigh, we're talking about a, a private institution that has, you know, it's got a great wrestling tradition. It just doesn't have the numbers in like when you're voting for something like this, they don't have the, the alumni base that an Iowa or an Oklahoma state does. So I think that's what maybe ultimately cost Burley, but statistically we've got a bunch of three time champs here, but, he was a four-time finalist. So that's one of those things where he kind of sits there as, as maybe a real good possibility. Uh, moving to Nate Carr, we have a does not place, then wins three titles, 17 losses. And like I said, this is where we're getting to the point where uh, the, the, the we're wrestling more matches. I think the depth was really starting to be apparent in college wrestling in this era. Of course, we had a lot more, a lot more teams in the era when in the, in the early eighties and guy like Nate Carr really kind of hit his stride in his last three years. But uh, the, the car family, as you mentioned on the notes here, I mean, you, you couldn't throw a rock in the eighties and, and hit a, and not hit a car that was an, on a podium somewhere. No, I mean this, we were talking about, you know, some of the legendary families in the sport. And obviously we talk about the Smiths, but we also have to include the car family. This is just a fascinating family. I think they had 16 siblings, eight of which were boys of those eight boys. Five went on to become all Americans. We talk about Nate a lot and we talk about his son, Nate Jr. now. But one of the guy, one of the brothers that we tend to forget is one of the older brothers, Jimmy, who actually made the world team in 1971, made the Olympic team in 1972 at the ages of 16 and 17. I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, if we had, if we had a phenom and we're talking about phenoms left and right, we talk about a 19 year old Kyle Snyder winning an Olympic gold. We talk about a teenager, Henry Cejudo winning a gold as a teenager uh, or no, as a 20 early twenties, right? 21 was Henry. I'm pretty sure he was close to that range. Like I said, right. off the top of my head, it's not a stat. I was going to look up but to verify. You, Thanks for putting my hair on uh, splitting hairs again. But <laughs> But can you can you imagine what we would be talking about if we had a 17 year old kid making the the team in 2020 and who he would have what to would, beat you know what to make that team? You know what would happen is is if people were saying that there's a 17 year old on the team, they were like, well, he actually should be in the 10th, uh, the 10th or 11th grade. They probably talk about him holding back. Right. That's probably what they'd be talking about, to be honest with you. You know how people are. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah. There, the, here I am kind of hijacking who Nate, Nate Carr was like, there's so much greatness in and around the family and the greatness of what he did. And it can be overshadowed when you're one of the family members, there's other narratives and other storylines that can overshadow, but you look at Nate and, you know, being a three-time champ and you, you, when you look back at Nate, he was one of the most explosive athletic, probably one of the most ex explosive in athletic competitors we've ever had. I remember him. I remember his battles with, with Kenny Monday, with Andre Metzger, with Dave Schultz, all these people. And I mean, you could just, we, we sit back and we talk about the Marinelli and the Vincenzo Josephs. Those are matches that, you know, I, I remember and that even at a young age, I was fortunate enough to watch. And it was, it was formative in my development as an athlete and my engagement in the sport. But this was a guy in, 
Now, did he get not get pulled back in his freshman year because it was he was in the era of the no, pulling. it was actually it was, but he lost to Roger Frizzell on the top side, and then lost to a guy named Tony Siraj from Rutgers, huh. who ended up placing. And so there was that was legit. Uh, he, it was actually beaten twice out of the NCAA. So then he had, you know, again the question is is like how many losses is too many losses? I mean, we got seventeen, and for a guy like Nate Carr, won three titles. Not too many three-time champs have that many losses. But again, back to like we said about Joe Williams, nine of those were as a freshman. So you know, and you're in those those monster weight classes. So um, Nate again, I think would sit with her. Oh, actually, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go back to a real quick story because I mentioned the, the Versailles Versailles actually was interesting because <laughs> the first time. I ever got an introduction to the Carr family was at the Virginia duels in 1996 and Woodford County high school, the school I just mentioned uh, came to the Virginia duels and we drew them in the first round. They were coached by Joe Carr. Uh, they were coached by Joe Carr and Joe Carr jr. Who eventually went on to wrestle at West Virginia was on that team as a senior uh, junior or senior. And they also had a guy named Ian Horn who had curly blonde Ben Askren type of hair and we we were we we thought we matched up well with them, and it it was just everything. The wheels fell off. It was just wheels fell off, and we lost to this team. We're like Kentucky, and then Joe Carr goes out there and wrestles our, our freshman kid named Jacob Inge. Actually, ends up making uh, the state finals that year as a freshman. And it's like, okay, well, Jacob's a freshman, and then then we realize, well, wait a minute. Later in the year, Jacob's in the state finals. We're like. And that Joe Carr Jr. guy was pretty good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've got a car reference, a Versailles slash Versailles reference, and whatever we got. And that, that was completely accidental. But uh, that was my first run in with the Carr family. And and years later, I've gotten to know Nate Jr. pretty well. And, you know, you want to talk about just that that family and, you know, how, how Nate, you know, raised Nate Jr. to be, you know, just a wrestling mind. He's really doing a good job in, in coaching. I love his mind as a coach. And even though he didn't have the accolades that his dad did or the rest of the family did, Nate Carr Jr. is, is a fine wrestling coach. And that's something that um, I've really, really grown to appreciate that family more so knowing Nate Jr. And, you know, I've had my, my associations with, with Nate Carr. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, like, yeah, really, it's, it's kind of cool to know Nate Carr Jr. and just hear him tell stories about his dad and his uncles. So, yeah. um, you know, I learned through that in that situation. But, yeah, I would probably, if, if we have to disqualify someone, I would say 17 defeats i would think that that would and this sounds like we're discrediting a three-time champ right holy cow like, i didn't have 17 wins man <laughs> <laughs> but i'm looking and i'm thinking about it just from a have seven from a historical standpoint when you're looking at three timers off the top of my head the the only one that i would say could rival the number of losses was maybe march mark branch possibly yeah yeah because branch had um uh... I think it was nine his freshman year or seven, whatever the lore goes. Again, I can pull, pull that up very quickly Mark, here. Mark, Thanks to Mark had a losing record going into the NCAA tournament his freshman year, I believe. Right. Yeah. That's that, the see, legend is he was six and seven going in. So he finished his freshman year 13 and nine. So 13, nine and one was branch branch. had Yeah. Branch had 19 losses in the nine, seven, three, and then undefeated. And of course, you know, you're in the finals four times. So, you know, four time finalists with, with 19 losses is, uh, it's pretty significant. So that's, that's up there. You're right. You called that one right now. Another one that comes into discussion here is Mark Chirella, who had 13 losses, but statistically finishes three, one, one, one. And Chirella, again, this is a situation where I want to say recency bias. And you're like, wait, what? No, again, working on that podcast uh, topic, with Pat Christensen, I had heard a lot of footage, heard a lot of audio footage about Mark Terrell. I heard about what his kids talked about him, about his coaches, his opponents, what Lee Kemp said to about him. And, and, and this is one of these things that my, my understanding of Mark Terrell really, really grew in the past couple months while I was working on this project. And the guys, I mean, like, like many of the greats, he's got a move, you know, he's got a ride named after him because he was ferocious with the legs. I really didn't know his style of wrestling until I actually had a chance because uh, to, to go back and listen to other people talk about him and then go back and try to find some footage. Because when you watch Ryan and Josh wrestle, you know, his kids, uh, they, they didn't, they didn't, you know, of course there's a little bit of dad there, but I didn't see a whole lot of crazy top beat the heck out of you, pin you, hurt you type of stuff from them. They were, they were powerful, but the, I, I felt they were more, more slick and bruising than they were just uh, torturous. So Going through Mark Chirella's career record, his freshman year, 
He lost to Roy Oliver, who is a three-time All-American Arizona State. And what's interesting about Chirella when he goes through his championships, three straight years, we talked about wrestling the same opponent three times has only happened with with uh, with Caruso. Well, Chirella beat three guys from Iowa back to back to back in the national championships. So it was Joe Zussman, Bruce Kenseth, and Mike Deanna. And he avenged one of those losses in the Big Ten tournament, and he never went undefeated. So statistically, we've got the best of that group is a 3-1-1-1, which to me really puts him in a discussion. The 13 losses maybe puts him on the fringe, but you've got a guy that, and then he beat three straight Iowa Hawkeyes in consecutive years in the finals. It's like, okay, this guy is definitely got an argument. And then people saying it, how great he was, like one of the greats, even though he did take a loss here and there. And, you know, it was, it was strange that he's, he's, he is revered everywhere. And he's got a great tournament out in Las Vegas. But just, again, learning about Mark Torella in these last couple of months really kind of makes me lean heavily his way and being one of those guys that could replace, you know, Wade or Joe Williams. And if you look at just the placements alone, I think it could be justifiable. Yeah, I think so. Unfortunately, like this is where this is one of the wrestlers that I'm not that familiar with. I know I know of Mark Moore as the person and, and he's a great individual, a great person. And, and his sons are a reflection of him um, and who they are, not just the way they competed, but the way they carried themselves like, you know, is a testament to him. And, you know, so his greatness again to have a wrestling position named after you that shows you like the impact that you made in your era that this, this name, I think we've, we've assigned different. If you look out through the history of wrestling, we've assigned names to techniques, but once another wrestler from another generation dominates with the same technique, we kind of credit that person with that. But the Chirella ride, has always been the trailer ride in, in my mind. And, and this is coming from an, uh, an Ohio guy where the state of Ohio doesn't give any credibility or any, any respect to the state of uh, Michigan. And even in Ohio, everybody knows this as the Torella ride and the dominance of uh, Mark Torella. And it's still a relevant technique. I mean, we saw his sons, we saw Josh and his sons use this, not probably to the level of his dad, but you know, in the modern area era, this mm -hmm. technique still has legs. No pun intended, right? <laughs> True. I'm I'm yeah, full of those. I, I remember first cow. hearing it. I'm not even trying to do first, that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember first hearing about it. I'm in high school. We had a guy named Graham Hunt wrestling in the state semis. Uh, who was he wrestling? Um, Anthony Lanier from Laurel Park. Oh, he actually the winner got Scott Justice in the finals. If that ought to tell you how long ago this was, this was. Why do I even remember Anthony Lanier? Laurel Park's not even open anymore. And he was just this jacked dude. And, and Graham was a little wiry and kind of that, like, I don't want to say skinny fat because he was in good shape. He just didn't look very defined. And he was in there working. He's trying to, and he, you know, Coach Ruff is yelling, Chirella, Chirella. And I don't know what the heck a Chirella is. I don't even know what he was saying. I'm like, Chirella? Like, like, <laughs> I, I had no idea. Years later, I figured out the position. And it made mo a lot more sense on why he was trying to set it up from that position. I'm like, Oh, now I understand what Billy was screaming at Graham for, you know, 20 some folks. Well, I'm remembering a match 25 years ago to prove the first time I heard Chirella. Yikes. I need to move forward. So uh, st stats wise, three, one, one, one is going to, going to definitely be on the, on the, on the doorstep and having a technique again, named after you is, is another one. Like, uh, you know, Steve Martin would always yell McElravey's at his kids when he was coaching at Great Bridge. Now we're getting to the uh, alphabetically the era of the the post World War II and even before World War II because we've got Tommy Evans from Oklahoma, forty two and one, freshman ineligible, two one one. Doctor, the late Doctor Stanley Henson, thirty one and one, freshman ineligible, three time champ. And Kerry Colat is modern era. We'll we'll come back to him. Uh, Bill Cole, freshman ineligible, actually pre World War II, then comes back one one one. He never lost, and his senior year pinned twelve out of fourteen opponents. So. And then we go to Wayne Martin, uh, 39 and two from Oklahoma, freshman and eligible, one, one, one. And Bill Nelson, Northern Iowa, 46 and three, champion DNP, one, one back in the day. So of those, 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 those uh, pre Gable era, I guess is how we can, can describe them. It's really hard. I think Cole might be the one guy you can argue because he was undefeated. But again, we're, we're talking in an era that, 
you know, my mom was born in 1948. So th- this is this is something that is it's legendary. And I know when we were talking about setting this up, I actually had a fan email me about a discussion Kyle Klingman and I had had and said, you didn't mention Bill Cole in your top 10. He never lost. And I went back and looked it up and true, he never lost. But I think maybe because we look at we have to look at depth and I, I'm not looking for a reason to disqualify Bill Cole. Of course, Rob Cole will be calling me very, very quickly unless uh, he doesn't listen to the show like John W. doesn't. But none of Bill Cole's opponents in the finals ever won a national title. And we had, you know, one guy he beats, Edgar Welsh, doesn't place the next four years later. Um, we've got uh, Roger Snook goes two four four. John Fletcher from Navy goes three and two. So, I mean, the I'm sure you you making the finals. It, it, it's you know quality opponent, but it's like the it, the the lore again of Bill Cole is about that great those those 1950 championship teams and how he was a great coach and you know it was is it more coaching and he was undefeated. It's, I mean, he's like the the old school Kale where he's undefeated national champion is a great coach at Penn State. Well, interesting uh, you know comparisons there. So. Uh, I'm just, I don't know how we can really measure these guys fairly. Um, what's interesting about Stanley Henson in my research is he is 31 and one. His loss was to Bill Keys from Oklahoma, who was a national champion that year at 155. Henson won his title a weight class below. So do you penalize a guy for, does he A, was he bumping up to get the better match or was he moving down so he could win a title? And, and Henson won three titles. Uh, we lost him last year. Was uh, did great things in in the world of medicine. Uh, Doctor Stanley Henson actually worked on some some uh, throat surgical uh, you know procedures and and research that actually my daughter actually was a beneficiary from almost eighty years later. So it, it's really strange that uh, I, I met him years ago and did that first podcast with him, and he told me he was working on this certain thing. So uh, you know I'm gonna there's a, there's a little personal tie there that I would vouch for Stanley Henson, but that that's all I've got to cling on with these things. And uh, I, I don't I don't know how we can fairly and accurately give them their due um, in, in saying they should be on or they shouldn't be on. So I guess that's where I sit with some of these old timers, even though uh, the records are impressive and that's what you had in the era. Yeah, I mean, they could only wrestle the matches that they were given. And in that in that era, I mean, they weren't afforded many opportunities to com- compete. Um, there was just a, a lot of restrictions. Um and a lot of other things going on in the country at the time that that we're aware of historically, but we didn't have to live through them as well. But it's funny, like I never thought about this, JB, like the significance, the two, there's only been two undefeated national champs in their career. And that's Bill Cole and, and Kale Sanderson. And they both like a three, Yataki. Yataki, yes. Yes, and yeah, but days. they both of those that went on to coach in college, those two both coached at Penn State. That's just a sidebar. It's interesting. But I guess back digging back into your point. Now we put how how, how, how sarcastic is Kale's kids going to be if you were following that? Because <laughs> <laughs> Rob Cole has got a great sarcastic wit about him. Yes. Yes. Um, so when you we talked about we talked about Mark Branch and and um Nate Nate Carr's losses so I think if we're if we're putting weight on the number of losses like Nate had too many losses that disqualified Mm -hmm. him I think in this case we have to apply it to the other side of the ledger that you didn't have enough matches we needed more of a sample size to see what you would have done See, I thought you were gonna go with we can't penalize for not the matches, but you have no losses. We've got if we're measuring total number of losses, we actually have to look at Bill Cole's undefeated as as a definite consideration here. True. With never losing and being a three time champ. I mean, he's one of very few people that have undefeated college careers. So I I definitely think that really puts him into discussion. And the more I think about it, I'm like, well, I'm almost ready to just put him in that top the f- top five right now and then argue over the last spot at least on my list, because just statistically he, he was the best of the era at the time. Uh, he pinned a lot of people, uh, you know, although the finals opponents never won themselves. Well, then again, he also kept three of them from winning titles and he he's zero losses. He didn't lose to a guy and move, move a weight class like, like Dr. Henson did. And so, I, I mean, I'm almost ready to, to like say, all right, I've been convinced that Bill Cole should be in this top five. I mean, you're winning me over here because when I think about it, when you, when you get into the minutia, when you get in the weeds of all time, great conversations, usually one of the, the, the defining arguments is winning percentage, right? Well, Bill Cole has 
1.000 after his name. Not many people can say that. He's on the top that. of every list. Right. I mean, you, you can't argue with that. It's a perfect, he ran the table. And to your point about who, who, who he beat in the national finals, you can't control that. He beat the guys that made it there. So I don't think you can disqualify a guy for saying, oh, he didn't beat this opponent or that opponent. Like, no, he just beat everybody that came out and wrestled him. Literally everybody. So I think you're winning me over here. I think I'm ready to put Bill Cole on the top five. Now we get to the more modern era and I, you know, Kerry Colat and Tim Krieger did not wrestle against one another in the modern era, but we've got both of those are two time champions and, and Kerry, you know, obviously he's, he's, tied to this network and, and this company, but a, a two, three, one, one. And then you've got Tim Krieger who goes five, one, two, one. Yeah. Worthy people to put on the ballot. I mean, I think Greg comedian, Greg Warren actually jokes that, uh, you know, he, he had to wrestle Tim Krieger one time and he goes, you know, there Tim Krieger lost, you know, like three matches in his career. And no, see, I think he said like, he, he was obviously playing with the stats creative license. He goes, this guy lost three matches in his career. There are some days where I lost five, you know, it's like one of those <laughs> things. So I'll, I'll remember that story. And that's the story where he talks about Wes Roper. He goes, Oh, Warren, I wouldn't piss this guy off. <laughs> so if you want to want, want some laughing, go back and listen to Greg Warren stand up on that. But uh, let's see those things. Again, we've got a two time champ. We got the same type of situation we get with Daryl Burley is where do you put the two time champs comparing to the field of three timers? And because we we've got that. And I, I don't think there's, I mean, I'm also somebody that came up through the end of the Colat era and got to see him wrestle the U.S. Open. A couple of my my good friends from my wrestling club back home were were at Lock Haven when Kerry was coaching there. So, I mean, in you know, with with the relationship and uh, what we've got at Rudis and what what he's done at Campbell, so he's he's definitely in the picture in terms of that. Uh, not just the recency bias, but the guy was just such a beast, and it was a pleasure to be able. I I told him after he was at the U.S. Open that one year in Cleveland, I said, dude, it's it's a pleasure to watch you wrestle, man, because I, I didn't get to see it. Like, you know, I'm just missed it. I just missed it. And I'm not one of these guys. And actually a funny story about, um, Carrie is when he was coaching with, when he was in Maryland, he were in Fargo one year at the turf and we're, we're talking, he goes, Hey Jay, what am I, what am I most, no, most known for in college? And I looked at him point blank. I just went transferring and he goes, Oh, okay. Yeah. And then he said, what's the next thing I'm known for? He goes, was I ever looked at his gas tank? I go, well, he goes, no, I had one bad match against Ironside, one bad match. And all of a sudden I don't have a gas tank, one bad match. I mean, it's funny how like the, that's the one match that of course he doesn't want to define his career. Cause anybody that watched more, watched him more than once know that that was not the case, but yeah, they, they, they will never get to live that down in Carver Hawkeye. But uh, back to our, our discussion thing is this again, two, three, one, one, it's impressive. But again, we've got three timers that would probably have to, to move on. So Krieger and Kerry might have to, as good as they were, they, they might have to fall out of the conversation. And, and that leaves us with, uh, actually, well, I'll let you speak on that before we jump to our last name here. No, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in Kerry's, Kerry's mouth, but knowing Kerry, Kerry's the straightest shooter I've ever met or what darn near the top of just calling it like it is. And I, I would envision if I talk to Kerry right now, he's like, you know what, Matt? He's like, I would go toe to toe with any of what, one of those guys, but based on her career, no, I wasn't one of the greatest. I only won two. Look at the, look at all the three timers that were ahead of me. Look at the careers they had. And I think he would be the first one. He, I don't think he would ever admit that any one of those guys could have beaten him, but based upon what their career looked like, the outcome and the results of their career, I think Kerry would be the first one to say, nope, I'm on the outside looking in. You know, it's just to that point. I mean, he goes back. This is how candid he is. He talks about the the year when he had to wrestle, re wrestled the match at the World Championships. When they he won the match, it got overturned, and then thirty minutes later, they just the refs just overturned the results. They're like, "Nope, we're going to make this guy the winner," and they made him re wrestle the match. And he said, "I they, I had to re wrestle the match thirty minutes later." He's like, I got beat. And he's like, you know, really, Matt, the thing that pisses me off. He's like, I got so consumed with my emotion that I should have just said, I beat this guy once. I should have beat him again. So shame on me for not beating him again after I'd done it before. So that that's how direct and how how little ego Kerry puts into himself. Like he literally had every reason in the world to this day to complain about how his career was stolen from him. And he was like, no, that was on me, Matt. 
I should have just gone out and beaten the guy. So I think based upon that example of how he views his career and reflects back on his career, I would think Kerry would be the first one that would say, nope, I'm not on the list. I didn't do enough. Okay, good. So we're, we're going down the check boxes of things that people, you know, it's like the, we're, we're at, people are adding us to their list. First it's John. Now it's, now it's Rob Cole. And then now we've got Cole out. We, we're going to piss off now. Um, I honestly don't, I, 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 I feel bad saying this, but I didn't give Tim Krieger the research that he probably deserved based on, we got to this list and we were like, okay, there's a five there. There's a two there. There's only two titles. And uh, again, I, I, I feel like I, honestly, it's, it's, I, I did, didn't give him the time to even make an argument. So, but again, statistically we got the five, one, two, one, and you know, I can, I can probably look here real quick. I'll, I'll pull it up and see what, uh, what the numbers are just to, just to give myself maybe a little peace of mind to know that I'm not just skipping a guy cause I was lazy, but uh, I know how I heard he was really good. Uh, I heard he was uh, again, one of those bruisers on top and the story of Tim Krieger, if I could spell his name, right. Would be it would be helpful. So any any Tim Krieger stories that you've heard over the years while I search on this, you know, the only thing I remember about Tim and he's a guy that I remember, but remember at the time in the eighties, we there outside of amateur wrestling news coming out three months after the fact, um, the results coming out two or three months after the fact, and not having limited oper we have very limited opportunity to watch actual competition. I read about and I heard about Tim Krieger, but. From what I remember in the stories I, I've heard in some of the limited match footage, he was just a very controlling wrestler, wrestler in all areas. It, he wasn't dynamic in any of the three. He was just dominant in every every area, if that makes sense. All right, well, I'm going to have to dig in. I mean, because again, again, my, my own ignorance here pr makes me look stupid because uh, I was the top. He had He was absolutely correct. He only had three losses in his career. Wow. And two wow. ties. So now let's 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 dig on this. So now I have a chance to save some face a little bit. Um, it's not the intent here. Eighty six was the one seed. Uh, so if you've only got two losses and you're the one seed, and both those losses are at the NCAA tournament, it's pretty 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 straightforward that you were undefeated going into the tournament. So his losses to Scott Turner from NC State, who was the nine seed, uh, it looked five five one zero, oh, and then drops down. And uh, looks like that was good old Joey McKenna, but from Clemson, not the one that we know of now. Those were his two losses. Then then looks like he beats uh, Jeff Cardwell there from Oregon State. So two as a freshman. Now looking back at his, his profile, uh, was undefeated as a sophomore, winning a national title. Now 88, we got to go to 88, just, just, just to, again, at Iowa State, Tim Krieger, where did he go? Loses to Scott Turner of <laughs> NC State. That was his kryptonite. Two of his three losses were to Scott Turner. Are you kidding me? Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this is just 1-1-1-0. One, 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 oh. I mean, it was binary code of wrestling. And just just for giggles in 89, what happens? I mean, that just, uh, that just he makes... He beat Carl Monaco from Montclair State. So, yeah. I mean, that just oh, leads man. me to believe that... That's a stylistic matchup because what what did Scott Turner do? What he was he was a couple time All American. I'm trying to remember. Well, clearly, at least twice. Yeah, Let's, I mean, <laughs> but the significance of he being a oh two time All American, he beat an all time. I should have looked that up really wow. before the show. I mean, I, I feel irresponsible for you, the listener. So Scott Turner was uh, blood round third first, 85, 86, eight, and there's no 87. I don't know if he didn't qualify or if he redshirted or whatnot. But uh, yeah, it was a uh, nine seed twice, and then the second seed once. Uh, yeah, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Oh, actually, no, no, take that back. DNP, R12, three and one. So 84, 85, 86, redshirted 87, came back and won it in 88. So actually, you know what? Pat Tossie talks about him all the time. So, well, not all the time, but his name gets mentioned when we talk about uh, that area. So maybe. So, uh, wow. So I've, you know, uh, but, but again, we've got three, we got a two time chant with three losses. Wow. And and two were in one. So basic, you had a bad day. You had a bad day, and that's just because of the five is now going to disqualify you. I don't know. Tim Krieger might have to make himself back back up on the list. I mean, that now, now that we've actually spent the time and on just the surface level of, of looking at it, that's that's an interesting thing. To the consider. only thing I would Jimmy say, Zaleski. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll jump back in at the end and wrap it up. I'll I'll add some additional thoughts with Krieger, I guess. So. Um, yeah, because we got Jim Zaleski, five one 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 three time champ. You know, now now we're we're comparing him to guys like Joe Williams, who was seven one one one. So you got the five. Jimmy had less losses, had more one hundred thirty one eight and one. His losses his freshman year 
were Ricky Stewart, who was the champion that year, and then Dion Cobb from Northern Iowa, which is the kind of kind of the head scratcher loss if you look at it historically, because Cobb didn't place the next year. Uh, again, we've got a lot of stuff there. Is was you know Jimmy was the coach of Iowa at the time this thing came out. Where where does where does he sit? I mean, is that is that Rushmore season of Iowa? I mean, you're comparing you know Joe Williams to Jim Zaleski possibly for the fifth spot here. I mean, it's it's Iowa versus Iowa. And if you look sheer numbers, uh, Jimmy's got him beaten in terms of placement overall, and then less losses. But um, you know, I mean, how do you, he's got also undefeated seasons? So I mean, it's weird. Uh, it's kind of hard to justify bumping either of them off. And then you've got we got Tim Krieger entering discussion. We got. Uh, Where's the other guy? Where were that? Where's you know, obviously we put Cole in there. So we got guys fighting for that fifth spot. I don't know what to do right now. I've, I've totally backed myself into a corner with this. Yeah. When I, when I think back on Jim Seleski, I think of another Jim that I kind of look and bunch the two together. And the other Jim from I would be Jim Heffernan. These guys were two phenomenal wrestlers from similar eras in the Iowa, in, in, in the Hawkeye uh, history, but they were, they're such soft personalities. They're such great coaches that we we kind of look past how dominant they were when we're talking about Jim Zaleski and, and Jim Heffernan because statistically we're talking five one 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 as opposed to seven one one one. So and it was and it's and then like, Chirella up there we're arguing three one one right. But I mean he's he's a guy like and again we we look at Jim now and and I'm. I'm not, I don't know Jim well or, or really at all, but I look at he, him as a wrestler, he, him as a coach. And I don't, I don't think we're ever going to give Jim Zaleski his due credit for his impact into the sport of wrestling, not only as an athlete and as a coach. And I don't think he makes this list, but I do want to put up there. And I, I put a note down there, JB, like if you look at his athletic career and his, and his coaching career, it almost runs in tandem and parallel with one Tom Brands. And most people don't want to, they don't want to talk about that because, and I, and I have all the respect in the world for Tom Brands, but he has the persona that people want to see. He had, he embodies the persona and the personality of Iowa wrestling. And even though Jim Zaleski was an all-time great athlete and an all-time great coach, he has the same amount of team titles that Tom Brands has, but we don't give him near the credit that he deserves. So he may not th make this list, and I don't know how many people will tune into this, but I, I want to make a case for Jim Zaleski being one of the all-time contributors as an athlete and coach to the sport of wrestling. And, of course, there's the asterisk that's going to circle 2020. Does Brands win another title and, and now break that tie? So, uh, you know, that's one thing, again, that's not a, a, a contributing factor to the list of arguing the 75th anniversary team, but it's definitely a good point to bring up. So uh, here's where I'm at with this as we, as we wrap up this second segment of this, of, of re revisiting the 75th anniversary team, 15 years later here on the Rudis wrestling podcast, Lee Kemp, Lincoln McElravey, Pat Smith, and I'm going to go ahead and put Bill Cole in there as my four. So now from my position, I've got to figure out are we in a situation where, okay, is it, it, I think I have to, as much as I hate to do it now that looking at Krieger with three career losses, comparing them to, we got 13 career losses, but there was, I mean, March is all that matters. We've obviously seen that now and the way we're doing it. And you know, it, you know, if you have a bad day, if, I mean, if he's, if he's two, one, two, one, maybe there's an argument, the five, the two in the two in the tournament, that's, that's really kind of hard. You, I mean, you lose three times in your career, twice to the same guy. And you've only got two national titles to show for it. Think about the, just what wrap your head around what it takes for that scenario to actually happen. It is it's just wild. I mean, it's like Greg Jones' sophomore year, you know, those type which we will get to next episode. But it's like, I, you know, where do I put it? And I, I might actually have to lean to of of the ones that were left, the guy with the most career losses, but the best career tournaments, three one one one. I think I might have to go with Mark Chirella as my number five. Well, I'm I don't want to make this the, the conclusion of this episode that boring. But... It's absolutely not the conclusion, by the way. And that, of course, remember that me Ed bumps weighed out. I, and I'm with that. And why I would, and Joe Williams, why I would, I think we established on the show last week 
I, at least for me, titles carry the weight at the end of the day, you mm -hmm. know, what, what's going to, what's going to tip the scales, titles tip the scales to me and then placement at the tournament, like it or not, like it's astounding. And I knew Tim Krieger lost very few matches. I didn't know it was three. That's, that's mind boggling almost. And mm -hmm. to lose two of those three matches on one day of your career in, in a four year span, you, two of the three are on one day, but unfortunately that one day came in March. And right? two of the three are the same guy at the same the tournament, same different years. I mean, it's right. like, I mean, it was, it's just, I, I, I probably should have spent more time on that because I, I, that's one of those things that maybe, maybe other people watching and listening had the aha moment well, as we, as I discovered it again, this is one of the things that's fun for me is even though I came to this, came to this party, pretty research, it was the one guy I didn't really do, give, give a whole lot of time to. That was one of the most eye opening of the situation. So again, I am in totally enjoying this discussion. We'll, we'll leave it up to you to decide uh, you, the, you, the listener to be like, okay, I mean, is, is, is the, is it a, four is are the four solid and then we we revisit who the fifth one is because again Shallis and joe williams i you know we're, we're bumped out off my list putting them in the pool against mark Chirella, jim zaleski tim krieger daryl burley who i think is i mean five losses and three to randy lewis and i mean just i mean carry two three one 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 of the best two three one ones you can ever find so uh it, it, this has been a fun experiment so far and we get to go to the upper weights on the next episode Matt so uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that. No, it's going to be a lot of fun. I had fun fun today. I mean it's it's fun and I apologize for for some of the listeners out there. We made me myself. I don't want to lump you into it JB. I I made several mistakes on the show. I need to get it more dialed in. Um but yeah, Come I mean, on, Matt, you know, there's the rule of podcasting. You're not <laughs> supposed to apologize to the listener. They don't know you screwed up until you tell them they screw up or I tell you, you screw yeah. up or I tell me that they screw up. <laughs> yeah. So we'll try and dial it in, but there's so much information to, to attack and, and uh, assimilate and actually have a conversation, but it's, it's fun to actually uh, dig through the levels of this, because I think like a Krieger, perfect example, you, you look at him. Five one two one or whatever it was it or like or whatever his play was. Whereas like obviously this guy was a great wrestler, but I think most people without digging under the surface like you did would just say, yeah, you were a great wrestler, but you're not an all time great. Like no, he arguably the, the, the could hell be. I am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at that. Here's something that I also thought I looked at. Tim Krieger was a number one seed four years in a row. Wow. I'm going to have to look up and see how many times that's happened. I know that there was a, somebody asked me how many times somebody's been a three seed. And I looked that up, but uh, Tim Krieger was a number one seed, 86, 87, 88, 89, and 150 pounds. Wow. At that weight class, at that weight, class. at that weight class. Holy cow. Yeah. I think we got a mic drop here for episode for, for this episode. So we'll be back to finish things up later. So uh, I'm out of breath. I'm uh, I'm out of, I'm out of hair products. I don't need any for a while, but for, for Matt Dernlin, this is Jason Bryant. You've been listening to episode 143. Are we at 143, Matt? 143. 143. Yeah, 143 of the Rudis Wrestling Podcast.